What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the B-hole, I think number 34. Um, yeah, shit, shit's going all right. Doing, doing all my traveling here in Mexico. I'm, I'm, I'm actually having a, I mean, my life is great. I, I'm having the time of my life right now. I'm getting to experience what most don't. Um, and you know, before I was doing all this, I'm like, oh man, you know, like I'm going to post everything to YouTube. I'm going to show everybody what I'm doing and you know, people are going to be interested in this and that. But like the more and more I'm traveling, I'm like, the less I give a fuck about showing people what I'm doing. Like I kind of just want to live my life for myself and I don't really, I don't really feel the need to constantly post videos about all these things I'm experiencing and doing like, because no matter what I say in a video, no matter what I show with my little camera, it's, 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 it's only a fraction of the reality of what I'm doing. Does that, does that, does that kind of make sense, man? And you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've kind of been not, not thinking about stopping putting out videos. Cause I, you know, I've been doing this for almost four years now and I do like it. And I do think especially with my stuff in Cambodia, I have a lot of views on my stuff from Cambodia, like thousands and thousands. And now on average, I'd say my, my videos probably get about a thousand views, sometimes 2000, a little over a thousand, whatever. And obviously, like, like I said, I don't, I don't really do this for the money or the views or the, you know, the, the YouTube fame or whatever it is, because, um, yeah, that, that's just never why I got into it. But, but a part of me just like, you know, you know, like, is it even, you know, like, am I making a fool of myself almost, you know, like, that's, that's kind of how I feel sometimes, like, I'm trying to put out these videos, and I want them to be good, and I want people to take something from it, and I know that some people do, um, and I know I've got a pretty small following, I've got about 16,000 subscribers, and again, like, I'm not comparing myself to other YouTubers, I'm not comparing myself to anybody else, because I'm my own man, I'm my own style, and I understand that with the kind of content I've put out in the past, especially in regards to like, you know, just, just, well, just, just all the stuff I've talked about and the, the, just, just my, my overall kind of presence on camera, I understand that I'm not for everybody, but a lot of people do like what I do. I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes I think about just saying, fuck the videos. I'm just going to live my life and just like fuck off of YouTube. It's kind of funny that coincidentally, last night I got this email from a guy, some, some, you know, guy who sent me a pretty rude email. He said, he said, I wanted to tell you personally, can you please stop updating on YouTube? Sincerely, thank you. Or something like that. Basically this guy very, very like douchily requesting that I stop making videos and stop posting on YouTube. And I basically gave him, uh, the response of, well, I'm very sorry, you know, to, to inconvenience you, sir. And on behalf of your request, I'm going to stop uploading to YouTube. Um, and I'm going to delete all my videos. I had no idea that you were the one who had a problem. I'm so sorry. Or option number two, you can simply do what everybody else does. Stop watching and go fuck yourself. I'm really hoping he went with option number two, of course. Um, pretty rude fucking email. But like I said, coincidentally, he sent me that just in a moment where I'm thinking like, why do I even make videos anymore? Like I get like a thousand views a video and sometimes I'm almost, I'm not, I'm not even proud of it anymore. And maybe it's just like, um, maybe it's just like a little funk I'm going through. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm still going to keep pumping out videos, but like not about every little thing I'm doing. Cause I don't think people really give a fuck to be honest. Like that, that's pretty much it. But I do have a small following and one of the reasons I do keep going are because of the emails I get. I get emails from very interesting people that are like under, they're like underground people that will never really, um, underground people meaning like people that society might, 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 um, deem as bad people or crazy or mentally ill or people with, people with, uh, dreams that are like pipe dreams or whatever, ba basically like this underworld of people. And they kind of, I guess I have like this cult following from all these really kind of interesting people. And I'm going to read a bunch of emails in this 
show because I have a lot of emails to read and I'm just going to read them like fan emails. I'm going to give some information and they're going to be covering different subjects. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. But first, I have to give my B-hole fitness tip. Um, and whether you work out or not, I really think that these little fitness tips will help you. As you know, I'm a certified personal trainer. I like to work out myself. I have plenty of experience as a fitness trainer, kickboxing coach, boxing coach. I've been involved in this fitness realm for over 10 years, about actually 12 years now. So I know what the fuck I'm talking about. What I want to talk about is periodization. Period. Ization, meaning that you segment your workouts and your exercise routines into periods. Pretty simple, right? So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna touch on this, and then I'm gonna get into email. So basically, let's say that you're like like most guys, you want to put on some muscle, lose body fat, you want to look good, you want to get stronger. Great. All right, there are th- three rep ranges. There there is the low rep range. There's the moderate rep range, like hypertrophy, meaning you're going to build muscle size. In other words, what bodybuilders do. And there's and, and then there's your endurance rep range. So your strength rep range will be anywhere from two to five reps with higher rest intervals. So for example, if you're training for just strength, pure maximal strength, you would do, I don't know, let's just say six sets, three to five reps, three minutes rest in between each set. So real, real, real low reps, right? A lot of rest, but super heavy weight. And then you have your hypertrophy range or your moderate rep ranges. That would be anywhere from, I would say, 8 to 12 reps, which is the most popular for building size. Not necessarily strength or stamina, but just straight up hypertrophy, meaning size. You would do, for example, three sets of 8 to 12 reps, about 90 seconds rest in between, and then you go on to your next exercise. And then you've got your endurance rep range, which I'm currently doing right now. That's actually what I'm doing because I'm trying to tone up a bit, and I just kind of, I just kind of like doing high reps too. Because you're not, you're not as sore, you're not as slow, you're not as um, tight, which I, I like. I, I don't like to feel tight in my muscles. I like to feel loose and kind of quick. Uh, that would be anywhere from 12 to 15, uh, sometimes even as many as 20 reps, and you don't want to rest any more than 60 seconds in between a set. So my point is this. Let's say that you're just starting to work out. I would suggest you start, especially if you were new to working out, I would say you start in the endurance rep range. Endurance rep range. So you want to you you want to keep it, eh, you know, 12 to 15 reps, you know, 2 to 3 sets each, 60 seconds for the first month. And then your next period as in periodization, you want to go to a uh, lower rep range, you go to your hypertrophy, right? So for the next month, you you know, and it could be two weeks, it could be, you know, it could be a month. You do 8 to 12 reps, and then you go to maximal strength, which is 3 to 5 reps, and then you kind of period uh, uh, per- periodize your workouts. You kind of go in cycles because your body gets very good at adapting to anything, whether it be a climate, whether it be a type of food, and especially when it comes to working out, like you guys have heard the term hitting a plateau, which means you're just going to maintain. You're not really going to get more results. So for example, if you're just doing a hypertrophy hypertrophy rep range, like 8 to 12, and you're doing that for six months, well, you know, you're still going to look good and you're still going to, It's don't get me wrong, it's still healthy. You're still going to maintain, but you're not really going to make progress because your body's so used to that. So you got to shock your body. That's why you got to throw different exercises in there. Um, you gotta you gotta fuck with your rest periods. You gotta fuck with your reps, and you can also do things like if you want to use the same weight, you can actually use the same weight for a long time, but you gotta use different techniques to shock your body to make it more difficult. It's called it's called um, progressive overload. So, for example, like if you have let's let's just say what well, actually I use myself right now since I'm on the road, I'm traveling, I'm in and out of hotels, I'm constantly on the road traveling all over Mexico. I have 20 pound dumbbells. Well, I, I have 10 pound dumbbells. I got 20 pound dumbbells. And I know you might be thinking, oh, you fucking pussy. That's all you can do. Well, no, I, I can actually do a lot more, but I'm not trying to lug around 80 fucking pound dumbbells. And also, I challenge you to use 20 pound dumbbells and use them correctly. Because a lot of guys, 
you see them go in the gym with their big old dumbbells or their big old barbells, and they're not really using correct form. They're they're relying on momentum. They're jerking the weight around. They're yeah, and, and they're, they're not using good form. So things you can do to make light weights harder is use slow motion reps. Slow motion reps. So rather than going one second up, one second down, you go three seconds up, three seconds down. That is a way to make a light weight harder. Or you do what's called one and a half reps. For example. With a bicep curl or bench press, just for example, let's say I'm doing a bicep curl and I want to do one and a half reps. I start at my hips with my arms completely loose, right? I come all the way up to my shoulder with the, with the dumbbell, and instead of going all the way back down for one rep, I go halfway down. So my arm is at a 90 degree angle, and then I come right back up and then back down. That's called one and a half reps, right? So those are ways to... Switch up your workouts after a few weeks to make shit harder for you. And the same can go for cardio. Let's say, for example, you just run a mile on the treadmill, a mile around the park or whatever. That's cool. That's cool. But your body, again, it's, it's, it's going to get used to that same stimulus. So, what you can do, instead of running a mile around the park, you run, I don't know, let's just say, for example, you run quarter mile and then instead of running you do high knees for 30 seconds straight high knees like you like like you run but you're bringing your knees all the way up past your waist and then you do that for like 10 sets and intervals during that mile so that's a way to shock your body and get more cardio or you can jog and then other days you can do hill sprints Right, you run, you run as fast as you can up the hill, and then you walk down. You do it again. That's a way to shock your body and to get more results. Anyways, think about that. If you're working out, you're not getting the results you want. And obviously, guys, nutrition is number one. You could be working out like a fucking beast, and if you're not getting the results you want, I I I challenge you to or not not challenge you. I'm sorry. I ask I ask that you take a daily nutrition log. And you write down what you're eating before your workouts, after your workouts, for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, in between, whatever. And not just what you're eating, but what you're drinking. Are you drinking enough water? Are you drinking soda? Are you drinking too much coffee, which which pushes water out of your body? Are you drinking fucking mocha frappe, fucking faggot, pumpkin spice lattes from Starbucks? And if you are, and you, you wonder why you, you, you can't fucking tone up, well, there you go, buddy. Anyways... Let me get to some emails. Got a bunch of emails here. Let's see here. Alrighty. Pull this bad boy up right here. Sam, what's his name? Sam Grafton. Title of the email, Mushrooms in Oaxaca. He says, hey, NJH. In one of your beehole vids, you mention Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. While you're still in Oaxaca, could you talk about shrooms and or shroom ceremonies there? Supposedly, Oaxaca is a hot spot for mushrooms slash traditional sh shamanic shroom ceremonies. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Paz. Paz, Paz is like peace in Spanish. Thanks for the email, Sam. Yeah, um, I actually have watched a lot of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia on YouTube, and if anybody doesn't know who, Ham uh, who Hamilton Morris is, he is a um, psychoactive drug enthusiast slash chemist, and he's got a lot of pieces on Vice. Uh, he's got he had his own show called Pharmacopoeia. He's been on Joe Rogan show I think like three times. Um, he's been on other podcasts too, like on the Drug Classroom on YouTube. Very very interesting guy. And he's a guy who really knows his drugs, but in a very scientific, educated way. And he also like likes to experiment with them too. And again, I'm, I'm sure you know in a very uh, controlled manner. Anyways, he had this he had this episode where he went to Oaxaca, where I just was uh, like a couple weeks ago, and he was looking after salvia. And salvia is like a it's like a sage type plant, and just like kratom. And other other things that are psychoactive, there's the good kind and there's the bad kind. There's Kratom where you can buy in a fucking 7-Eleven or whatever, you know, from some sketchy-ass Indian dude. Yeah, I said it. Give a fuck. 
You telling me Indians don't work at 7 Eleven? Fuck you. Yes, they do. All right. And you don't know what's in it. You don't know what kind of fillers are in it or whatever. And the same thing could go for salvia. When I was in high school, uh, the kids in school would talk about, dude, you got to take salvia, bro. You're going to fucking trip balls, dad. Fuck, man. And they were right. But I had to go across the border into West Virginia. West Virginia was like a fucking 10 minute drive from where I grew up. Martinsburg, West Virginia. And I would go to the Martinsburg Mall there, and I would get, you know, what was like 40x salvia for like 10 bucks or whatever. And I had no idea what to expect. And I put this shit <laughs> at the time, I think I was, what, 16 or, I was like 16 or 17. This was actually the first psychedelic experience I ever had, technically. I mean, I had smoked weed up at this point, but I had never been, I never felt like a dissociation or felt like I was in another realm you know, or on a different plane, like you do on a psychedelic trip, and I went to my dad's toolbox, and I found a fucking, um, like a socket, you know, like a, like a socket ratchet, whatever, and I found a socket, and I, I, I managed to pack it with salvia, and I hid it in my room, and I just, I just remember seeing what was around me, like, I could see everything that was in my room, and obviously, if you've done salvia, then you can kind of, you, you pretty much know that it's damn near impossible to put into words. I mean, and that that can go for any psychedelic trip. But the thing about salvia is that it's so dissociating, just as much as being in a K-hole, to where you kind of forget a lot of what you experience, but you can retain some. All I can remember from it was um it was like it was like being in a dream, like a very intense dream. But you knew you were in your room. I mean, that probably still makes no... It probably still doesn't even mean anything to you by me saying that. But what a fucking trippy-ass drug that was. Now, was that the real deal, Salvia? Maybe. I mean, I got in a fucking mall in West Virginia. All these little redneck kids were smoking it. You know, passing out or whatever. But Hamilton Morris went to Oaxaca and um, had the real deal. Like, they... They give him the real deal, like straight from the jungle, you know what I mean? And they do the same thing there with mushrooms. Now, I have I have a fair amount of experience with psychedelic mushrooms. Actually, uh, somebody in my family uh, actually grows them um, on a regular basis. They grow, they have a little mushroom farm. Well, not a farm, but a, a mushroom, uh, like a terrarium that you keep in, a, you know, snakes and shit in. And this, this, this family member grows regular psychedelic mushrooms it's uh i think golden teacher mushrooms and i've done a ton of them the first time i ever did mushrooms was actually when i moved back from cambodia to virginia and my uncle came over with some other oh shit i just said my uncle fuck my uncle came over uh wink wink my uncle wink wink it could be my aunt it could be a cousin it could be a brother but uncle came out of my mouth who gives a fuck Anyways, I took five grams to the fucking face. Took five grams to the face. And uh, I gotta say, it was a lot like doing ayahuasca. I'd done ayahuasca in Cambodia with an ex-roommate of mine who was a, uh, you know, a pseudo-shaman, uh, shaman, whatever the fuck. And regardless of my ex-roommate's... Um, legitimacy as a as a shaman the ayahuasca was legitimate and it was very very much like it except mushrooms were more mushrooms had um mushrooms had different stages mushrooms have different stages because like the difference between stuff like lsd and mushrooms is like mushrooms hit you hard like a fucking storm and then it kind of levels off and it has stages, like it has its super intense psychedelic stage, it's very introspective, you, can, you can't talk. You li I mean, at least for me, I literally couldn't talk if I wanted to. Um, you're the, the, the visuals are absolutely to die for, especially when you close your eyes, and you really, you really just kind of surrender to the thoughts you're having. The visuals can be incredible. And then it has kind of like a euphoric MDMA stage, where it's like you're on Molly, like, you, like everything's... Everything's amazing, right? You kind of reminisce. Music's great. Um, it's it's a lot like MDMA, like 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 I said. And then it kind of wears off into nothing, and then you kind of have a come down the next day. Whereas LSD is kind of like a 
kind of like an arc, right? Like it kind of slowly creeps up on you and then you peak after about, you know, five, six hours and then you kind of come back down and it, you kind of have like an afterglow. And ayahuasca was kind of like in the middle of that, right? Like it, it really peaked, I'd say in about three hours and then wore off at eh, say about six to eight hours. But again, you have an afterglow the whole next day and it's obviously DMT that hits you. Now, have I done mushrooms in Oaxaca? Obviously not. In fact, um, the last time I put an intoxicant in my body was, uh, it's been well over a month now. I mean, I, it was a beer, of course. As I know, it was actually Finnabut. I took all my Finnabut, I threw it in the fucking toilet, um, because what I did was I basically went on a bender. I went on like a three-day bender where I took modafinil. I took, uh, you know, maybe 1,500 milligrams of modafinil over the course of like three days, which is, I mean, I, I was up for three days wired. I was drinking Red Bulls, Monsters. I smoked six packs of Marlboro Red cigarettes. Um, I ate no food and I drank a little bit of alcohol and I had a, uh, obviously I was incredibly depressed for about three days afterwards and I made the conscious effort is like, dude, I've got to change my life because I'm, um, I'm totally reliant on substances still. Like, even though I stopped using opioids and benzos and, um, other, other harder drugs, I'm still into drugs, even though they're softer drugs. I'm still base my, I still base my day around when I'm going to drink and all that. And then I made the decision to stop. So will I ever do mushrooms? Um, I, I mean, I'm sorry. Will I ever do mushrooms again? Maybe possibly, but I have no intention of doing anything in the near future or the distant future either. I just, after reminiscing of, cause I've done so many drugs in my life now, psychedelics, uppers, downers, you know, left, rights, whatever the fuck you want to call them. Like I've done it all pretty much except for meth and PCP. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't offer me a benefit. It doesn't offer me a benefit. Um, I'm still the same guy. So I don't know, man, if anybody is listening right now and you're the kind of person to where you kind of organize your day around when you're going to smoke pot or drink or do anything, I'm telling you right now, it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea because you are a slave to that drug. And I can say that because I, I have been there so much. In fact, this is the, like in, in this, in this last month, this is the longest I've gone without using an intoxicant because I didn't want to. Now I've gone this long without using an intoxicant years and years ago because I couldn't, because I needed to pass a drug test, but I could be using drugs right now. Like I could be smoking weed. I could be drinking. I could be getting, you know, fucking tramadol, modafinil. I could be doing whatever, but I, I truly want to make a difference in my life and I'm doing so much better and I'm so much happier now that I'm not using any kind of intoxicants. I feel like I just don't need that shit. So anyway, Sam, thanks for the email, buddy. Got another email. Let me uh, wet my mouth here. Had an email, a bit of a long email, so what the fuck, dude? So they have a question, or maybe an idea for the B-hole. Sent from Amsterdam. All right, got some, got some Dutch fans. What's up? And again, guys, this is one of the reasons why I keep making videos, and I, I'm glad I do, because all these, all these people from all around the world email me with, with questions, and it's like, like that, like that's cool. So of course I want to help you out, you know. And they don't, they don't have to email me. They, they, they can email anybody and they're, they're emailing me. And I just think that's kind of cool. And it honestly, it does make me feel good. Uh, anyways, he said, been a huge fan since the early days. Really cool. You're in Mexico. It, you know, he, he basically goes on to kind of like butter me up basically. And, uh, let me see here. Ba, 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 ba. What follows below is just a context. So you have a better idea what it is I hope to learn from you if you have the opportunity to answer some sometime. All right, so here we go. Wow, dude, you really fucking piled this fucking email on, huh? Jesus Christ. 
He said, for instance, late night, big city, I'm walking home. And, and okay, so basically this email, he's asking me for advice on what to do in a street altercation, basically. So he's, he, he's trying to paint a picture. So he says, he says, for instance, late night, big city, I'm walking home, just me or maybe with a male friend. Um, have to turn into a darkish alley for the shortest way home. A couple of thugs slash homeboys hang out in the alley. Probably bored and looking to start some shit with whomever walks by, maybe rob them. Um, chance of them having firearms is as good as zero because here in uh, Amsterdam, only law enforcement and big time gangsters carry guns here. So they might have knives or chains or just, you know, just their hands or whatever. He says, he says, I will not take a detour to avoid an alley. I'll walk wherever the fuck I want in my own fucking country and I will not be intimidated or bullied by anyone. If I detour, I give those thugs power to control me. Not going to happen. Exclamation mark. Oh, he means business. I can put up a mean fight if I have to. I'm not an over-the-top alpha like you, but I'm definitely not someone to be fucked with. You know, do I do I come off like an over-the-top alpha? That 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 kind of... It's, it's, it's actually an insult. I'm not saying that you're intentionally insulting me, dude, but, but I don't want to be like a fucking over-the-top alpha. Like, I'm... And I'm not. Um, you know, I'm, de I'm definitely masculine and, you know, believe me, dude, I'll be honest with you. I'm not always the alpha male. Depend, depend, depends where you are. Depends, depends who's around, you know? So sometimes I'm not the alpha or I don't even feel like it sometimes, but I'll, you know, like I'll still, obviously I'm not going to take any shit. Yeah. But don't, don't, don't call me an over the top alpha, dude. That, that's almost, it's almost like making me out to be like a fucking meathead. Uh, but he says, I'd rather not fight, especially when outnumbered. He says, he says what to do acting totally timid or not threat or non-threatening and avoiding eye contact will appear weak and make me an easy target. But the opposite, like locking eyes, staring someone down will be seen as disrespect or a provocation. It will also lead to violence. Basically. All right. So, all right. What this guy Raymond's asking is, how should he carry himself if he's walking down an alley at night and there's a couple of dudes who look, you know, like they might be potentially dangerous? How does he carry himself to best avoid a fight, but also send off the signal that he'd be a problem to fuck with? All right, so some let, let, let's let's go back to what he said earlier. He said that. He said that uh, that he will not avoid an alley to avoid trouble because that makes them the winner. Well, listen, man. Think about things in percentages. Think about things as probability. All right. Now, just because you avoid an alley with probably dangerous people in there that could poke you with needles with. STDs in them that could stab you, that could beat the fucking shit out of you, that could rob you. If you if you avoid that alley, does that does that mean that you're a pussy, or does that mean that you're using your brain and you're you're recognizing that the probability for your safety and survival is greater if you avoid the alley, even though it might take you an extra five minutes to walk home. Now I don't know about you, but I will do that. Like if I'm walking in a city here in Mexico, it could be any little town or city here in Mexico, and you know, I know that if I walk down this street, I'll be at my house five minutes sooner, but I know for a fact there's a group of dudes there that will definitely, most likely, want to start some serious trouble with me. You know, I'm probably going to avoid that, dude, whether they're dogs or whatever. It's, just, it's, it's called using your brain. It doesn't mean you're a pussy. This is what makes you a pussy, dude. And listen to what I'm saying. What makes you a pussy is this is if you do walk down that alley, and dudes do fuck with you, and then you just fucking, you just quiver on the ground like a little bitch, that makes you a pussy. See? Now, something else. How to carry yourself in that kind of situation, because sometimes it happens unexpectedly. It's happened to me plenty of times. In the United States, in Mexico, definitely in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Alright, this is what you do. Body language with avoiding eye contact. Because what you said was, what did you say here? 
You said if you act totally timid and non-threatening and avoid eye contact, it'll appear weak and make you look like an easy target. Well, you're right about one thing. You should avoid eye contact. Now, what I do when I'm walking past a group of guys or, you know, and, and, and I've done this plenty of times, I don't look them in the eye. I look, I look at them from the chest down. I look at their hands. I look at their, their body language. I look to see if they're carrying anything. And I don't look them in the eye. But at the same time, I maintain a strong posture. I maintain, you know, a straight back, my shoulders back, my chest out. You know, wh uh, another thing too, check this out. Another thing too about commanding respect, walk slowly. Walk slowly. Walk strong and walk slowly. Because if you're walking all slouched or all fast, people see that as you being nervous. People might think you're a cop. People think you're scared, and people do smell fear, especially guys like that who want to maybe fuck with you, who are bored, they got nothing better to do. So this is my advice. Walk with your shoulders back, your chin up, your chest out. Walk slowly, like you're not scared of shit, but be alert. You still need to look around. I'm not saying just, just walk with your chin up and look straight ahead. Know your surroundings. You know, if you do hear something behind you, Fucking look behind you, dude. But just don't go like, huh, what, what was that? Huh? You know, because obviously you're going to look like a little bitch. Just fucking look behind you, dude. Like, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Because you might think that you seem like a pussy for looking around. Well, you know, what if, what if somebody does sneak up behind you? And that could have been avoided had you just been more vigilant and aware of your surroundings. Secondly, like I said, when you do walk past these thugs, maintain your strong posture, walk slowly. Be ready to protect yourself, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, but look at their, look at what's in their hands, look at their body language, don't look them in the eye, you know, and if you do, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't feel like you got to maintain eye contact. A lot of guys too, you know, like if you pass a guy on the street and he looks potentially, you know, uh, posing or whatever. He looks like he could be a potential threat. A lot of guys think that if you look him in the eye and then you immediately look away, that that's like a sign of you being a bitch. And he might take that too, but I do that all the time. I do that all the time. Like, I don't care if you think I'm a pussy. In fact, that's actually works to my advantage because you're going to underestimate me already. You know, if I see a dude and I, and I just happen to look him in the eye and he's like fucking scowling at me. Like, I'm just going to look away. Like, I don't need to waste my energy trying to be a tough guy with you. That's a waste of energy. I'm not going to get into some fucking fight or altercation just because I want to see who's got the bigger dick here. Get what I'm saying, man? Like, fuck all that macho bullshit. All right? It's all in your mind, dude. All right? Anyways, I think I made my point. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. All right, got an email. This guy I've actually talked talked about him before. He says, uh, "I've decided not to give up weed, but sticking to lifting and start eating healthier." That's fine, dude. You can you can be a pothead and work out and eat healthy. <laughs> I mean, tons of people do it. I used to do it. You know, there's tons of people that still smoke weed. But they pick their spots and they don't let it take, they don't let it overtake every aspect of their life. Like their diet and their, uh, or their nutrition rather. I don't like the term diet because the term diet is always, always seems negative, right? It, it always seems like, it always just seems like work. It seems unfun. Like nutrition just means what you put in your body to, to optimize your overall existence. Mentally and physically. He said, can you please do a simple cooking video or give example of easy, low-calorie filling dishes to make for cutting? All right. I'm going to talk about cheap, affordable, easy ways that you guys can lose weight, eat healthy, you know, on a budget, something that's quick. Check it out. Go to your local supermarket. Frozen vegetables, dude. Frozen cauliflower, broccoli, green beans, peas, whatever you like. You know, but make sure it's mostly green. The cool thing about frozen veggies is that, obviously, they keep for pretty much ever. They maintain all their nutritional content that raw veggies do. Except you can keep them for longer, right? So, for example, something that I like to do. I get a big old bag of frozen broccoli, 
and I take a portion out and I chop it up with, with, with a knife, baby, like a big old knife into the consistency of like rice. And if the frozen is too hard for you to cut up with a knife, then, then like let it sit in the fridge for a few hours or just overnight. And then in the morning do it and then cut up a big old portion or in fact, just do it the whole bag and then, and then, and then you can store it in Tupperware containers. Um, saute it up in the pan, just like rice. Throw some, throw some grass-fed butter in there, or some avocado oil, some olive oil, you know, or, or just, you know, just any kind of fat source, or, or none. Season it. What I like to do to save money is throw a bunch of eggs in there, because eggs, your body absorbs 99% of the protein as opposed to meat, where it's like, it depends, it could be anywhere from like 50 to 80, depending on how it's cooked or how old it is, but eggs are a cheap, affordable way to get your healthy fats and protein in your diet. Um... And, you know, eat eat the egg broccoli rice. You can also throw, you know, meat in there, of course. And Tupperware containers are your friend. Tupperware containers are your friend um, because you can portion out your meals that way and have them prepared. You know, if you're going to the gym or whatever, you're going to your job or you're coming home from work, you always have a meal prepared and it's, and it's, per, and it's portioned already. So portion out your meals in Tupperware containers and... The key to cutting is this. The key to cutting is this. Obviously, you got to keep your carbs lower, right? But when you eat, never eat till you're full. All right? Big fucking difference. Never eat till you're full. Eat till you're satisfied. Eat till you're not hungry anymore. And then three hours later, obviously, you're going to be hungry. Eat again. And just keep that hunger at bay by eating small meals that satisfy you every three hours. You might have to eat, you know, five, six, seven times a day, but keep them small. Keep your carbs low, protein high, fatty, uh, pardon me, essential fats high, or health, I, I should say healthy fats. Examples of healthy fats that you can eat while cutting are things like avocados. Avocados are great because they're pretty affordable. Um, they're, they're very healthy for you, of course, and they're satiating, meaning that they kind of fill you up. They, 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 they kind of satisfy your hunger or rather they, they satiate your hunger, you know? So for example, you can have a small Tupperware container with a bunch of the broccoli rice, you know, you know, maybe like three eggs in there that are kind of like you sauteed into the broccoli rice, maybe a couple shreds of chicken or beef or whatever. And then you got a half an avocado, boom. Good fucking meal, healthy meal. Alright, keep it green and you'll be lean and all that good shit, man. I promise you, dude. Alright, eggs, great, great sources of protein and healthy fats. Coconut oil, avocado oil, um, um, olive oil. Avoid things like vegetable oil, canola oil, and um, any other kind of oil like that, basically, right? Um, seeds, like sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, nuts like pecans, uh, walnuts are great, um, almonds, um, even, even peanuts, and I know, uh, they're actually legumes, uh, you'll fuck yourself, you're a fucking douchebag, all right, peanuts are nuts, fuck you, all right, and then, and then, and then basically stay away from the processed foods, all right, so keep it, you know, keep it to like chicken, a lot of fish is good, canned sardines are great, all right, canned sardines are great, but you kind of want to mix your meats up. So maybe do chicken one week, lean beef the next. You can do pork. Basically, keep your carbs and your sugars low, all right? And that includes fruit. Keep your fruit low, bro, all right? Meat, vegetables, eggs, nuts, seeds, some fruit, lots of water, no beer, no soda, or on occasion, and you should be fine, man. Alright, frozen vegetables are your friend. They're way cheaper than raw vegetables too. Alright, hope that helps, bro. Let's see here. Alrighty, got Leighton Taylor. Traveling by Leighton Taylor. He says, hey man, I really love your videos. I love your take on shit. You really inspired me to change. I want to travel. So what in your mind, uh, part... God damn it. So what, in your opinion, is a good number money-wise to go off and travel with? Obviously, you can find work later, uh, work later on, but what is a good starting point? Um, man, you know, destination is going to be key and lifestyle is going to be key. So if you're the type of person 
and you got a lifestyle where you like to go out every night, you're a big drinker, you got, you're, you're kind of, um, got, um, you know, like, you got, like, uh, expensive taste, right, like, you gotta stay in a nice place where it's got, like, fucking full room service, you know, uh, you know, fucking fountains in the lobby and shit, you know, big-ass gymnasium and whatever, you know, and it's gotta be in the most posh luxury type of hotel, you know, you're gonna need more money, obviously, but if you can stay at a budget place where you got a bed, you got some Wi-Fi, you got a little fan or air conditioner, and you can make that work for a few weeks to a month or so, um, or just simply rent an apartment, you can do, you can, uh, you can do that as well, then you won't need as much money, you won't need as much money, and, and, and if you're the type of person that doesn't require going out to drink every night, or getting fucked up, or going to expensive restaurants, like, one of the big reasons I was able to save so much money in Phnom Penh was the fact that when I did drink, I would simply just go buy beer at, on the fucking street, like, there, there's street vendors everywhere, you buy beer, it's 50 cents a beer, or 2,000 two real a beer, um, and a, so a six pack is three bucks. And if you go to a bar, I mean, a beer's gonna be a dollar, right? A beer, a beer, a beer's gonna be a dollar. And then, you know, you might want to, you know, go out to eat, at the, you know, the fucking burger joint where it's eight bucks for a shitty ass burger, or you can go eat street food for 50 cents to a dollar a meal. That is why I was able to save so much money. Now, with that being said, when I arrived to Cambodia, I think I had around 3,500. In that, like, that was after I went to Thailand. I got my plane ticket, so. All in all, before my travels, I saved up 5000 You know, my plane ticket to Bangkok was about, it was just under 1000 bucks. So, boom, 4000 I definitely spent a few hundred in Thailand. I, I, you know, definitely went on a little spree there, and it was fun. But within a week, I spent, you know, almost, like, almost $500, so keep that in mind. And that, and that was because, that was because I wanted to have a fun time. But when I got to Cambodia, I had 3500 maybe around 3000 so something like that, whatever. And um, I made that shit last, dude. So, like I said, it depends on destination and lifestyle. I would say if you have a high-end type of lifestyle that you want to maintain, and you're going to an expensive place like Europe, right? I mean, I, I would say take no less than 5000 after the plane ticket after the plane ticket, and if you're coming to a place like Latin America, or Southeast Asia, I would say after the plane ticket, if you have a moderate lifestyle, you can comfortably go there with two to three thousand, I'd say as low as fifteen hundred, if you know where to go, and stay, you know, like stay and eat and everything, I would say as low as fifteen hundred, as long as you can make that last you for a month or two, which you can absolutely do in a place like Cambodia, you know, um, absolutely you can, even here in Mexico, like, you can make that last you months here in Mexico, if, if you're fucking very ec ec economic, obviously, that's kind of to the, I don't want to say extreme, because that, because that makes it seem unattainable to most people, but I would say, be smart and bring two to three thousand as a cushion, because you never know what kind of problems you're going to run into, most, most newbies to a country don't know where to go, right, so they end up spending more than they should, so it's good to have a cushion, I would say the magic number after the travel cost, $3,000, moving on, burned by bad fake Viagra in Cambodia, wow dude, uh, he says, hey man, thanks for the tips in my earlier email, blah, 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 he said, he said, I'd like to tell you about the world of pain I'm in after taking some generic slash fake Viagra by the name of Silfect. Took some home to have fun with my lady here in China. So I guess you came from China to Cambodia, then back again. And he said, after a 100 milligram tab, I felt like Bernie Sanders was having a bonfire in my boner. I don't know what that means. Or no, he said I had a Bernie Sanders was having a bonfire party in my gut. Pardon me, in my gut. It also didn't help me get a boner. <laughs> Went from the worst heartburn of my life to God, where's the nearest hospital? Blah 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 blah. Okay, he says, just wondering if you've ever had similar such scenarios with generic, fake, or any pharmaceuticals while abroad. I looked into this company that makes this shit called World Medic. 
Packaging says they're Turkish, but their website literally says it's manufactured in Kur Kurdistan in Iraq or, or in Iraq, whatever. Um, yeah, he basically just wants to know my take on farm on pharmacies in Cambodia and elsewhere. It might help another dumbass like you in the... Okay. So basically, guy's in Cambodia, buys some Viagra, wants to fuck his chick in China with it, goes back to China, takes it, doesn't get a boner, and gives him a terrible fucking stomach ache, and scares the shit out of him. You know, of all the pharmacal, uh, ph pharmacal, wow, of all the pharmaceutical drugs that I indulged in in Cambodia, I, I am very lucky that I never had to go to the hospital, I didn't die, of course, I never overdosed, um, I never, I never got sick, never had a problem. Um, they were always great. <laughs> they were always great, man. Um, I did buy Viagra in Cambodia. Um, I was going to buy the actual Viagra, but it was like 74 fucking dollars for, for like four pills. And I'm like, well, I could spend $74 on four pills. I could buy these other four pills for $12. So I did that. Or no, I don't even think it was 12, dude. It was like fucking five bucks. And... I, I actually, I never had sex with them, but I did take one one time. I was super bored. I was super bored, and I took one just, just for the fuck of it. I was like, ah, let's see if I get a boner. And I remember I ended up get, uh I was like, well, you know, I'll just fucking jerk off. I'm going to take a Viagra. Eh, maybe, maybe I'll jerk off later, whatever, you know, which is already sad enough in and of itself, right? Like, you're going to take Viagra just to jerk off. But, uh, I didn't, I didn't notice anything special with it. I didn't notice anything special with it. Um, but I didn't get sick. I didn't get sick. Um, so I can't really talk on that. As far as my experience with pharmaceutical drugs in Cambodia, every time I used them, what, uh, there were, there were opioids like codeine syrup, codeine tablets, tramadol, oxycontin, um, ketamine, you know, fucking ketamine, um, morphine, dehydrocodone, hydrocodone, Xanax, uh, Valium, you know, I'm sure there are a few more that I fucking, uh, like, forgot about. Every single time I used them, they always worked as they should have worked. And I would combine them and take way more than I should have, and I never had a problem. With that being said... I do not encourage you to do the same thing. Bad, I cannot believe, I'm, I'm, I mean, dude, I'm telling you, I did so many fucking pills over there, it was insane. And the way I would combine them, like, I'm not meant to die right now, basically is what I'm saying, so. I'm really sorry to hear about your bad Viagra experience, man, um... If anybody else listening right now has had bad experience with pharmaceutical drugs anywhere, leave in the comments section, man, so people can see that shit and maybe avoid the same thing. So if anybody's abroad and you see a, a, Vi uh, a Viagra knockoff called Silfect, S-I-L-F-E-C-T, don't take that shit. And also look where the shit's manufactured. If it's manufactured in a place like the Middle East, eh, don't take it. All right? Most of the pharmaceutical drugs in Cambodia are made in India. India is a, one of the world's le uh, leaders in pharmaceutical drug production. All the ketamine I, 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 that I ever did was all from India. All the tramadol I did was from India. Um, and, you know, probably fucking China too. I don't know. But definitely mostly from India. So do your homework on it or just don't do fucking drugs. Anyways, moving on. Let's see here. Your videos are helping me tremendously by Bobby Axelrod. Man, your videos are like I'm watching myself, brother. We are the same in so many ways. I watch you on YouTube every day. You are amazing, brother. I suffer from PTSD, depression, bipolar, and psychotic features, and your videos have helped me from hanging myself many times. Wow. I'm really glad that my videos have helped you from killing yourself, man, on multiple occasions. I've been living all over the world forever, in the Philippines the last 13 years, but I'm getting tired of the Philippines. Soon, when my disability gets approved, I'm going to Cambodia to enjoy some weed and rest and relaxation for a while. 
After a while in Phnom Penh, I want to go lay on a beach and relax. Where's the best beach area to go and smoke a little herb and unwind? First off, thanks for the email, man. I'm um, really sorry to hear about your psychological struggles. And if you are serious, the fact that you watch my videos and they've actually stopped you from killing yourself, that just, again, makes me very proud of what I've done. Because if I can even help just a few people or even one person from doing something crazy to themselves or other people or change their life or help them in any way, then what I'm doing on YouTube is worthwhile. And it does make me feel better about yeah, putting all this shit out, even though a lot of it is sometimes even very personal and embarrassing. Uh, anyways, so as far as the best beaches to go, you know, I got to be honest, man. And in, in my time in Cambodia, I never really went to the beach much. Um, I'm not a beach guy. I, I do like the beach, but it's not a place I want to go and spend days at all. Like if I go for a day or two or even just for a few hours, man, like that's fine with me. I'm more of a lake, river uh, forest mountain type of guy. Like I like the mountains, the forest. I, I like lakes, you know, I like things like that. But anyways, I did go to a few different beaches and I'll tell you about them. Uh, the first time I went to, Oh, and by the way, Cambodia doesn't have a huge coastline, by the way, doesn't have a huge coastline. Um, so I went to rabbit Island off the coast of Kaip also known as Koh Tun Sai, which means Rabbit Island. And you got to take a ferry there from Kaip. It's a, uh, you know, fucking, I don't know, 20-minute boat ride or whatever. And they have bungalows for rent for like, it was like 13, 14 bucks a night, whereas essentially it's it's like, it's like a hut. You got a bed, mosquito nets, you got a little bathroom. Uh, and you got a bunch of like, um, you, you know, like some restaurants and little, like, little shops on the, on the island. Very small island. You got a couple hiking trails. And the thing is that they shut down the generator, I think, 6 p.m. So if you're depending on something like, you know, it, just just anything that involves power, basically, you're not going to have it. Um, I don't believe there's an internet connection as well, so that's something to consider. So after 6 p.m., because people do live on that island, like, you're pretty much without any kind of power. So that's something to consider. With that being said, though, uh, the beaches there are very uh, peaceful, and there's not a lot of people there, of course, and they're very quiet, but the whole the fact that you're on a little island with no power does kind of suck if you're going to be staying there for long term, unless you just want to get off you know, the grid for a little bit. Um, I also went to Otris Beach just outside of Seanokville. That was a lot more touristy, which I'm not a big fan of going to touristy places, but there are plenty of, you know, hostels, hotels, guest houses there for very good prices, anywhere from, you know, 10 bucks to 30 bucks, just depending on what, what you require. And, uh, obviously there's power there, of course, and there's plenty of things to do. Um, but there, but there's other beaches along the way. Um, but I would say go there and just experiment for yourself, man. Experiment for yourself, you know. But like I said, the, the Cambodia doesn't really have a lot of coastline anyway. So the beaches there are pretty few and far between, and the, the, the ones they do have are going to be packed with, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're going to be designed for tourists, for the most part. Um, uh, but, you know, I would read this email, but it, it's just too fucking long, dude. You know, I don't... Guys, please, you know, if you're going to be sending me emails, look, I do, I do appreciate it, but it's like... If it if it's if it's like fucking five paragraphs, man. If it's like you know, if it takes me five minutes to read it. Honestly, dude, I got I got other shit to do, and I'm not trying to be a dick, but keep it keep it to like, you know, a paragraph or two, and and just 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 keep it direct, keep it to the point, and I'll definitely respond to you, whether it's on a video or not. Like I'll actually email you back personally, but goddamn, if it's so long, it's like fuck, man, you know. What makes you think you're so special? And I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but... Damn. Uh, sleep slash insomnia. Hey, I like watching your videos. I hope you're sleeping better. As you know, or as I know you suffer from insomnia. Uh, basically, he sometimes I have whole nights without sleep. Or I just keep waking up, blah, 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 blah. It really sucks. Sleeping tablets, sleeping tablets are not a long-term solution. 
However, mindfulness and meditation is hard to get into and hasn't worked for me so far. Maybe the more of a problem it becomes, the more you think and worry about it and the worse it gets. I think it's a topic many people can relate to. Has your sleep improved recently? And if so, what have you done to help it improve? I hope you're enjoying your time in Mexico. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the email, sir. Uh, the name is John Smith, and I'm assuming your name is not really John Smith. But thank you to the guy who sent the email. You know who you are. Um, yeah, a lot of people do struggle with sleep. And insomnia has been a large problem in my life. It's, it's caused me drug abuse. It's caused me to, to treat people poorly who I should not be treating poorly. It's caused me to treat myself poorly. It's caused me to be to make bad decisions. Um, however, i got to say in the last few weeks to a month, my sleep has gotten way better. It's gotten way fucking better. What have, what have I changed in my life to improve it? And before I say this, there, there, there's a great quote, and, I'm, and I know you've heard this before. It's a very famous quote. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting new results. That being said, I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. I completely stopped drinking. I stopped smoking weed. Stopped using any kind of mind-altering substance. I don't drink coffee after, you know, I'd say 4 p.m. I work out on a daily basis. I eat a lot better. I'm eating mo a lot of vegetables now. Raw, raw vegetables like beets, broccoli, carrots, cucumbers. I eat, I eat very, very well now. And I'm also around good company too. And I'm waking up early. I'm not, I'm not sleeping until, you know, 10, 11, 12 in the morning. I'm waking up every day around 7 or 8. Pretty much every day. And these are the same things that people kept telling me when I was deep into my uh, drug problem or slash alcohol problem. They would be like, dude, you got to stop smoking weed, you got to stop drinking, you got to eat better, exercise every day, and you got to you kind of get up at the same time every day. And I was like, oh, man, you know. And those are the things I, didn't, I, I wasn't doing. I was doing everything wrong that everybody was telling me. I was like, ah, oh, they don't know shit, even though my sleep was fucking it sucked. Now my sleep is way better. Do I fall asleep immediately? No, I don't. Sometimes I, I lay there for an hour and I'm thinking a lot, but I always fall asleep. I, you, you know, wake up a couple times a night to go to the bathroom, but I always go right back to bed. And every day I wake up now, I'm in a good mood and I feel fine. Because I stop drinking, I stop smoking pot, I go to bed at pretty much the same time every night, I wake up at the same time every day, I don't drink caffeine late in the day, I eat really healthy and clean, and I work out every day, and I'm around good company. So yes, thank you for the email, man. My sleep has improved. I, I really encourage you guys to take some of that advice if you guys have sleep problems. Or, not even if you have sleep problems. Look, you know, there's a reason why, why, why healthy nutrition and daily exercise is, is preached. You know why? Because it fucking works, dude. I think I got time for one more email. I'm going to wrap this motherfucker up. Mm. All right, last email. I'm going to wrap this bitch up. Hey, man, thanks for all you do. I moved to the kingdom, fell into the trap you did with the mass pharmaceutical addiction. I did teach English there, but I found I was a degenerate scumbag and fell into a really bad cycle, plus beers. Some Muay Thai, I guess he's saying. Also, the, the girly bars, too, got to me. Idea for a video. What tips do you have for people to avoid this and other traps? Obviously, I had to move back. Um, you know what, guys? I think I'm just going to do a video on this because I think it'll get a lot more views, actually, if I just do it on here. So I'm going to make a video on this soon. Obvious traps for people to avoid when going to Cambodia. Thanks for the email, Mr. Colton. Uh, thanks for all the emails, guys. If you do want me to read your video, or pardon me, your email on a No Joke Howard video or B-hole, send it to me, guys. No Joke Striking at gmail.com, bitches, alright guys, and please, like I said, please keep it to like, you know, two, two paragraphs at the most, maybe three is fine, and keep it to the point, please, alright, thank you guys, and also guys, if you like to follow me on Instagram, I post pretty regular shit from my travels here in Mexico, uh, just about every day, it's at Brayton Howard, and I will post the actual web link in the description box, comment section below, hope you guys enjoyed, hope you guys learned something, Take better care of yourself, man. 
you know, of your body and your mind, and your mind and body will take better care of you. I know it's lame and corny to say that, but it's fucking true, guys. All right, anyways, y'all, it's been a pleasure. Peace!